Well, on behalf of the Brewer Foundation and New York University, congratulations on advancing to the finals of the 20th Annual International Public Policy Forum. My name is Andrea Sadbury and I'm the IPPF Executive Director. The IPPF is the first and only competition that gives high school students from around the world the opportunity to engage in written and oral debates on issues of public policy. The contest is free and available to public, private, and homeschool students. This year, despite the ongoing pandemic, more than 180 teams representing schools in 19 countries and 25 US states submitted qualifying round essays on the topic, Resolved, the benefits of artificial intelligence outweigh the harms. Judges reviewed these essays and selected the top 64 teams to take part in our single elimination written debate tournament. In November, each team was paired against one other team and then volleyed essays back and forth via email with one team affirming and one team negating our topic. Over the next several months, this tournament continued and judges narrowed the field from 64 teams to 32 to 16 and finally to our elite eight. Now, typically, the elite eight would come together in New York to compete in oral debates. In response to the global pandemic and out of concern for the safety and well being of all IPPF participants, this year our teams have competed virtually. Beginning with the quarterfinal debates last night, our teams have been supplementing the written scholarship they produced over the last six months with oral advocacy. At this time, we would like to recognize all of these amazing schools. Our quarterfinalists this year, who will be awarded $750 in prize money, are Hobby School of Ulaanbaatar from Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, Ivy Bridge Academy from Johns Creek, Georgia, Peak to Peak Charter School from Lafayette, Colorado, and Troy High School from Troy, Michigan. Our semifinalists, who will be awarded $1,500 in prize money, are the Hockaday School from Dallas, Texas, and Potomac Oak from Rockville, Maryland. Congratulations to all six of these teams. Competing this afternoon in our final debate will be Montgomery Blair High School from Silver Spring, Maryland, and Slovak National Team from Bratislava, Slovakia. At this time, I'd like to invite our debaters to introduce themselves, beginning with the affirmative team, Montgomery Blair High School. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Shari Arvazgami. I'm a senior at Montgomery Blair High School, and I'm proud to be the first speaker for Blair today. Hello everyone, my name is Alex. I'm also a senior from Montgomery Blair High School and I'll be the second speaker today. And lastly, hello, my name is Jonathan and I am a junior at Montgomery Blair and I'm delighted to be speaking as the third speaker on the affirmative team today. At this time, we will ask the negative team, Slovak national team to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Antisa, I'm speaking first. My name is Teresa, and I will be delivering the second speech. My name is Martin, and today I'll be the third. Welcome, guys, and congratulations again. Now to introduce our distinguished moderator and judges. Serving as our moderator for this debate is Mr. David Baker. Mr. Baker was appointed in 1984 as coach of the St. Mark's debate team. He coached debating and taught public speaking for the 16 years prior to his appointment as the director of admissions and financial aid at St. Mark's. Under his direction, the St. Mark's Debate Program was named one of the 10 most successful programs of the 20th century and won the high school national championship in 1990. In 2003, he was elected to the National Speech and Debate Association's Hall of Fame. In 2006, he was named to the Texas Forensic Association Hall of Fame. He has been involved in the IPPF since its formation 20 years ago. Our judges, and our lineup has changed slightly. Our judges include Dr. John Sexton, who is President Emeritus of New York University, the Dean Emeritus of NYU Law School, and the Benjamin Butler Professor of Law. He joined the law school faculty in 1981 and was named the school's dean in 1988. He was named the university's president in 2001, a position he held until 2005. In 2016, he returned to the faculty. President Sexton is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and a past member of the Executive Committee of the Association of American Universities. President Sexton holds 21 honorary degrees from colleges in the United States and at Europe. Of particular interest to today's proceedings, in 2010, Emory University named him Outstanding High School Debate Coach of the last 50 years for his work with the St. Brendan's High School Debate Team. President Sexton is a member of the IPPF Advisory Board. Ms. Christina Phillips is the Director of Debate at Notre Dame High School in Sherman Oaks, California. 
a board member of the National Debate Coaches Association, and a member of the Policy Advisory Committee for the Tournament of Champions. Her students have reached the elimination rounds at many leading tournaments, including the NSDA Championships, NDCA Championships, and Tournament of Champions. Ms. Phillips was a four-year CETA NDT debate debater at the University of Southern California. Along with serving on the IPPF Advisory Board, Ms. Phillips is a longtime member of the IPPF Topic Selection Committee. She's coached many top performing teams in the IPPF, including the 2019 IPPF World Champions. She also wrote this year's topic primer. And our third judge is Mr. Julian Michael. He is a PhD candidate at the University of Washington, where he conducts artificial intelligence research. His work concerns getting machines to understand and represent linguistic structure and meaning. He has also worked on formal logic, machine learning, and benchmarking, and is a co-creator of the widely used glue and super glue benchmarks for evaluating large language models. His work has been published at many prestigious conferences, and he has conducted research at Google, Facebook, Qualcomm, Adobe, and the Allen Institute for AI in Seattle, Washington. Mr. Michael earned a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Texas at Austin. He is also a former debater and IPPF champion competing for Plano Senior High School in the 2010 to 11 tournament. With that, I will turn it over to your moderator, Mr. David Baker. Good afternoon or evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're happy to have you here. We'll get started right away. I'd like to remind our judges and team members to stay on mute unless you're speaking or preparing to speak. Of course, during cross-examination, we'll ask that all members of the teams and the judges keep their, their microphones uh, unmuted. Uh, we'll ask for everyone to stay on camera so that the, the, all the folks at home uh, can see you. And with no further ado, we will begin with the opening speeches. That starts, these are two eight-minute speeches, one by the affirmative, followed by one from the negative. Uh, we are ready to start affirmative when you are. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Before we begin, we want to give a quick set of, quick set of thank yous to the people who made this debate possible. We want to start by thanking our teachers, particularly our coach, Ms. Tinsley, for supporting us throughout this entire process. We want to extend gratitude to our parents for empowering us to confidently prepare. We want to thank our judges and our opponents for this round that we're about to have. And most importantly, we want to thank NYU and the Brewer Foundation for organizing such an enjoyable and insightful competition. With that, we are ready to begin. In 2010, three London researchers united to teach a computer how to play video games simple ones like Pong and Space Invaders. The artificial intelligence program quickly learned the rules of the games without any prior knowledge, leading the researchers to wonder whether they could transform it into a general purpose AI that could tackle the world's challenges, both big and small. Over 10 years and one Google acquisition later, this AI has learned to identify biomarkers for breast cancer, optimize the use of energy in data systems, and model complex processes like protein folding. DeepMind, an 11-year-old startup, creating the most innovative solutions to the world's most perplexing challenges is what AI is all about. Today, my partners and I are proud to affirm the resolution. The benefits of artificial intelligence outweigh the harms. Our first contention is healthcare. AI systems like DeepMind are improving quality of life worldwide. One of the key benefits of these systems is enabling humans to reach new heights in healthcare. Already, AI is increasing drug development while improving preventative health measures, both of which have the potential to improve health outcomes for billions. COVID-19 highlights the importance of continued medical innovation. Unfortunately, there is an innovation problem in the status quo. A report by Deloitte finds out that out of every 10,000 molecules, only 10 make it to clinical trials. Out of those 10, only one even passes phase one. As the law of diminishing return takes its toll, innovation will only decrease as research into new drugs becomes more and more prohibitively expensive. Fortunately, AI is poised to reverse this trend by augmenting existing medical capabilities and creating new ones. AI enables medical researchers to analyze large data sets in shorter amounts of time, improving the efficiency and efficacy of drug development. That's why a study by Deloitte finds that discovery stages and preclinical investigations are up to 15 times faster while employing AI. Additionally, AI can also create entirely new drugs at superhuman speeds. For example, AI algorithms formulated a new drug that treats patients with compulsive disorders in just 12 months. This stands in stark contrast to the standard five-year drug development process. Luckily, the benefits of AI will spill over into every medical field. 
as Professor Hopkins puts it. The beauty of the algorithm is that it is agnostic, so it can be applied to any disease. Drug development is of utmost importance, as from 1986 to 2000, new drugs were responsible for 40% of the increase in life expectancy globally. Beyond drugs, AI allows for the detection and treatment of chronic diseases with high precision. For example, AI can already outperform doctors in diagnosing breast cancer. And more importantly, AI is enabling the development of new capabilities to assess risk of developing a chronic disease. Early detection is the most effective method for reducing deaths from chronic diseases, which account for 70% of all deaths in the US and tens of millions annually worldwide. AI's impact in healthcare is just a microcosm of its future role in society. The same data analytics technology used to examine medical data can be used to increase their level of autonomy by which a vehicle operates and maintain the safety of global food supplies through the detection of crop diseases, pests, and droughts. All of these applications can quite simply revolutionize the world as we know it. Our second argument is workforce. One of the largest concerns with AI is its effect on the labor market. Although AI replicates certain human tasks, definitionally, this does not translate into unemployment, as humans can adapt and provide new roles for themselves in the global economy, something that has happened in every industrial revolution. Indeed, a World Economic Forum report from 2018 finds, empirically, businesses that employ AI become more productive, allowing them to enhance the output of existing workers rather than replace them. AI will also improve educational outcomes. Online courses driven by AI can provide an affordable, precisely targeted education to the underprivileged. For instance, in India, Upgrad has enrolled 2,000 students in entrepreneurship, digital marketing, data analytics, and product management courses. By leveraging these ed educational opportunities, low-income individuals can acquire the knowledge they need to secure jobs that will be created by AI. AI has already been beneficial in a multitude of industries, from design software for engineers to virtual operative assistants for surgeons, and also holds non-specific uses for all businesses and people like grammar checking software, natural language processing, and even virtual assistants like Siri or Katana. In the past 10 years, the frequency of contributions from machines and algorithms to human-led tasks has increased over 57%. So what does this all mean for the workforce? Well, worker efficiency and output are said to increase drastically. A 2018 analysis by Bain and Company estimates that average worker output will increase by 30% due to automation by 2030, and a McKinsey report concludes that AI alone will result in a 16% growth in global GDP by 2030, which equates to an additional $13 trillion of global economic activity. For these reasons, an international analysis of the impact of automation by John Hawksworth, the chief economist at PricewaterhouseCooper, concludes that AI and automation will lead to a larger and wealthier global economy and create enough jobs in the long run to offset the jobs lost in the short run. With that, we come to our third and final contention, climate change. See, the, one of the key benefits of AI systems is the protection of our planet from the exigent dangers of climate change. To get a quick glimpse at how AI can help confront climate change, we'll start in agriculture. The Union of Concerned Scientists names four impacts that climate change will have on farms, floods, droughts, changes in crop viability, and pathogenic threats. AI reduces the unpredictability, unpredictability that arises from all of these issues. Through obtaining satellite images of weather patterns and views of harvest outputs, AI can help optimize farm output while climate change threatens it. According to a study done by the World Economic Forum, widespread use of AI-based agricultural methods could reduce farming costs by $100 billion by 2030, all while saving 180 billion cubic meters of water. But the impact of AI goes beyond farms. Omdena, an AI startup contracted by the United Nations, recently developed a system of support vector machines to monitor areas of drought, floods, and violent conflicts resulting from climate change. This machine learning model helps optimize the allocation of utility personnel to handle climate change related incidents. Climate change disproportionately affects the world's most disadvantaged communities because they are the ones that lack resources to adapt to it. The first comprehensive study from the Global Humanitarian Forum finds nearly 98% of the people seriously affected by climate change come from developing countries. It is very possible that climate change is the single most important issue facing the global poor, which is why it is imperative that we use machine learning to help them. When we look at climate disaster projections, it's clear that a lack of intervention is doomed. The Institute for Economics and Peace explains that 1.2 billion people living in 31 countries are not sufficiently resilient to withstand ecological threats. Conventional technology will not save those billion lives and negligence certainly won't do it either. AI systems, which have been shown to decouple economic growth from carbon emissions and environmental degradation are our only way to withstand society's greatest threats. 
Climate change threatens the world's stability and society's newest technological disruption is our best bet to combat it. But as you can tell from this speech, AI is not just humanity's newest technological disruption. It is our greatest collective accomplishment, one that is nearly a half century in the making and rapidly improving for the billions of people who will gain access to education, work, and healthcare, for the millions of people who will be given access to food while being shielded from the onslaught of climate change's effect, we strongly urge an affirmative ballot. Thank you very much. We'll now move to the, uh, to the uh, first speech from the negative, eight minutes, and uh, give you a little time at the beginning. Let me know when you're ready. So similarly, as a, the affirmative team, we would like to express some words of gratitude towards a few memorable people. We would like to thank the Brewer Foundation, IPPF Advisory Board, and Andreas Sedbury for organizing this competition. During times like this, it's the effort of people uh, like you that make education opportunities available for students all around the world, and we truly thank you for your work. We also would like to thank our teammates that are not here right now, but worked on us, Emma Krijanova, Natalia Mihalcova, Sonia Konyarova, Timothy Orsula, and Mario Valek. We would also like to thank our coaches, Timofey Kozhukov and Samuel Nobota. We would like to thank as well Slovak Debate Association for their coaching and support through this year, and of course our schools, Leaf Academy, Gymnasium Juragronsa, and Suchemi. We wish our opponents best of luck getting uh, to this point requires a lot of teamwork and dedication and your team is a bright example of that. Hopefully this debate will be enjoyable to everyone. And with that, I will start my negative constructive speech. The world is not a fair tale where good always triumphs over evil. Unlike affirmative, we recognize that AI is a tool and its potential is bound to be misused by malicious actors. Hence, we urge our judges to consider the incentives of various actors involved and evaluate this debate based on whether the usage of AI is likely to result in a net benefit for society. In my speech, I will rattle the core of affirmative substantive. I'll introduce our first constructive argument about AI's effects on the global workforce. Lastly, I'll deliver our second constructive argument about the rise of digital authoritarianism. So firstly, healthcare. According to Dr. Drew Smith, recent uh, discovered drugs share two characteristics. Firstly, they impact only less than 0.0025% uh, of the world population. And secondly, because of this, they're extremely expensive as their medium price is $83,000 per patient, meaning that they're affordable only to a fraction of people. Reason for that is when we develop drugs, proteins are combined. However, we have already found most of the effective combinations and therefore drugs for diseases such as Alzheimer's or diabetes haven't been discovered, although AI was implemented. Therefore, the contribution of AI in medicine is insignificant, while the harms are massive, as you will see from our constructive arguments. Moving on to climate change. While the affirmative wants to take baby steps towards combating climate change, AI takes mankind two steps backwards by promoting consumerism. So as Alima explains, by constant retargeting and psychological tricks by AI algorithms, customers purchase products they otherwise would not even consider buying. Uh, the impacts of that is that according to Matt, AI causes users to make 40% more clicks and 50% more purchases compared to non-intelligent advertising. And this is important because as Eco Resolution states, 99% of products people buy are trashed in six months, creating 2 billion tons of waste each year. Because of AI, the number is expected to increase by 70%. Conclusively, AI nudges people to emit more than ever, adding fuel to the fire of our planet. Moving on to our constructive this directly clashes with affirmative argument. However, we will demonstrate empirical evidence for AI's effects on the global workforce. While our opponents celebrate artificial intelligence capacities, they clearly misunderstand the socioeconomic implications. Affirmative enjoy talking about increased economic output, yet there's no proof of that the fact that it will benefit all of the people in this planet. AI allows further automation at an unprecedented pace and scope since it enables the process by utilizing previously human exclusive functions such as image recognition or data processes. Uh, AI decreases the demand for new workers as the technology improves itself without human input. For instance, in robotics, image recognition has enabled previously blind machines to see and handle the product. The ability of AI to recognize speech and engage in conversations has been utilized in Google's call centers to replace humans as concluded by MIT Sloan. This is magnified much further in countries where the economy is based on manual labor. Their factories are largely reliant on exporting goods to the developed world. 
COVID-19 and Swiss Canal crisis prove that supply chains are extremely fragile, making companies reconsider their pres presence in the developing world, resulting into shifting from cheap manual labor outside of the country to increasingly more affordable automation-based factories in their countries. These impacts are devastating on the majority of the develop developing world population that are dependent on this income. Second, AI in global workers causes income inequality. I will talk first about lower class and then middle class. While the affirmative might argue that AI creates new jobs, which could provide opportunities to laid off workers, as MIT knows, such jobs require high skilled labor. At the same time, occupations that require less than a bachelor's degree have an automation potential of 55%. As most high skilled jobs require higher education, a simple requalification program will likely not suffice as provided by the affirmative, regardless of its efficiency. According to the Workforce Investment Act Gold Standard Evaluation, Government's reskilling programs are highly ineffective since most of them failed at raising participants' earnings and are offering services that don't meet the needs of job seekers or employers. Even if these programs were effective, they would still have low success rates of getting employment in the respective field because of the fact that while workers are being displaced by automation, new tasks are coming at a slower rate and primarily employ high skilled workers, according to research from Oxford Martin. In general, the increase in educational requirements will exceed the capacities of an average worker. People from the lower class often cannot afford to live without an income. Once these jobs are removed, they will struggle to adapt, thereby spiraling into the vicious cycle of poverty. Then middle class. Well, automation harms the poorest, intelligent automation harms the middle class on top of that. According to Gorsh, the effects of AI automation are drastically different from previous revolutions. Since whereas those early revolutions that AI affirmative side uh, cited, complement of human muscle, the new ones will replace human cognition. Consequential jobs like office support will likely be automated by AI, according to McKinsey. Conclusively, this diminishes the significance of affirmative's impacts, even if the affirmative's power could be used for good, an average worker will not reap its benefits. Ultimately, a technology that benefits the fortunate few at the expense of the unfortunate many is inherently harmful. Moving on to the rise of digital authoritarianism. In fact, AI's potential has already fallen into the wrong hands and strengthens authoritarianism in every regard by firstly, silencing dissent and secondly, intensifying oppression. First, AI makes authoritarian governance irreversible. Without AI, descendants could hide and thus escape prosecution. However, as stated by Paul Ekova, in places such as Hong Kong, dictators and semi-authoritarian leaders abuse AI and online activity trackers and facial recognition technologies to monitor their citizens, which deters disobedience. Moreover, by detecting suspicious behavior and preventing descendants from communicating and gathering, AI destroys the main ingredient of successful resistance. According to Parkinson, in Uganda and Zambia, Hallways AI help governments spy on their opponents, intercept their encrypted communication, and later identify uh, localized government, government critics and arrest them soon after. Distant hope for regime change vanishes with the rise of AI, dear panel. Second, AI proliferates human rights abuses against minorities to regime targets. According to Buin and Kirby, Chinese security services utilize AI to monitor and prosecute members of the Uyghur minority. More than 1 million Uyghurs have been forced into detention centers facing violence, torture, and enslavement. AI is key in capturing Uyghurs. As Anderson explains, AI algorithms hunt for ideological viruses, so to say, day and night. They are used to scan chat logs for Quran verses in order to prove that a particular Uyghur is not assimilated into the dominant Chinese Han culture. Notice panel that after AI's implementation, the number of annual prosecutions in China increased from 30,000 to 350,000, as Millward and Peterson note. This is important because according to the Human Rights Foundation research, uh, 3.9 billion people live under authoritarian governance. Freedom House as well finds that in 2020, 75% of the world's population lived in a country that faced deterioration in democracy. The proportion of not free countries is now the highest it has been in the past 15 years. But even more concerningly, according to the Japan Times, China is avidly exporting AI surveillance software to more than 60 countries, many of which are democratically flawed and susceptible to authoritarian tendencies due to the fact that China holds huge, huge influence over these countries. Conclusively, AI silences the outcry for democracy and gradually leads many hybrid political regimes down the path of digital authoritarianism. And this is very important because the negligible benefits of affirmative side, as they have provided in the medical argument, and we have mitigated them, are, are not important on the background of people being displaced and authoritarian governments preserving. If we look at the entire picture of this debate, while AI might benefit the lucky few, those impacts come at the expense of billions. AI turns hybrid regimes authoritarian, aggravates oppression and human rights violations. Additionally, AI robs millions of workers of their jobs with nowhere else to go. Conclusively, 
both the scope and intensity of harms incurred by AI far exceed its potential for good. Thank you very much. We will have a three minute preparation time period between the end of the negative uh, opening speech and the second speech to be given by the affirmative. Three minutes break. We will now have the uh, second speech from the affirmative. It's a five minute speech and you may begin. All right, before I begin, can everyone hear me clearly? All right, we'll get started. We agree that incentives matter in this debate. However, we should focus on the long term. Just like any new technology, AI may be imperfect. However, as algorithms improve, the majority of its drawbacks will cease to exist. In the long term, AI will revolutionize the world, providing benefits across all sectors that will offset the short term harms it causes. One key example of these benefits is climate change. If you believe that my opponent's arguments are true, then you should cast your ballot for the affirmative, because climate change magnifies the issues that the negative discusses on a much larger scale. First of all, climate change displaces workers, which is what their first contention talks about. The ILO finds that climate change will result in thermal stress that will cause 80 million people to lose their jobs worldwide. Second of all, climate change increases authoritarianism, which is what their second contention is about. For example, the Maldives, one of the countries most affected by climate change, saw its democracy fall as the economy stagnated due to the effects of global warming. And as climate crises occur, strongman leaders that consolidate power take hold and justify the postponement of democracy through the presence of emergency. With this in mind, let's go down my opponent's individual arguments, starting with the global workforce. There's a couple problems with this. 
First of all, the notion that developing countries don't benefit from AI is simply short-sighted. Yes, there may be a lack of infrastructure in the status quo. However, these countries are not stagnant. They're constantly developing. For example, the number of internet users in Africa grew seven times faster than the global average, and AI algorithms and online marketplaces are projected to create three million jobs there. In fact, emerging markets are already using AI to solve critical challenges. In the long term, all countries can leverage AI to deliver innovative business models that can leapfrog traditional solutions and reach the underdeserved. These new businesses, when created, will employ millions. Second of all, my opponents neglect the fact that online courses driven by AI can provide an affordable, precisely targeted education to the underprivileged. They claim that a lot of these new jobs that are created will have high skill requirements. Well, AI is actually encouraging, is creating new educational platforms that allow people to acquire the jobs to actually obtain these high skill jobs, which means that there won't be mass worker displacement. Third of all, not only will low skill workers be able to acquire higher skills and thus new jobs, but they will also have opportunities to take on new low skill jobs. For example, huge labeled data sets are required for AI to operate, and to generate the labeled data, countless working hours are required for annotation, which is a low skill job. Finally, I would like to emphasize that almost every past invention and industrial revolution created a net increase of jobs in the long term, which is what this debate should be about. For example, although the invention of personal computers destroyed 3.5 million jobs, it created 19 million jobs over time. Maybe in the short term, there will be some job losses. However, the World Economic Forum finds that AI will create a net gain of 58 million jobs in the long term. But if you don't want to look at the long term and you want to look at the status quo, evidence also points to, to the affirmative. A 2019 report finds that AI is allowing 40% of organizations to add more jobs while only causing 8% of companies to cut jobs. So clearly it is a net positive. Now let's move on to my opponent's final argument about digital authoritarianism. There's a couple problems. First of all, regulation will prevent this surveillance from being harmful. Brazil, 28 European countries, and numerous US states have already enacted restrictive surveillance laws, and the continued development and rising support of these policies will drastically increase the likelihood of their global imp implementation. This suggests that AI surveillance is a short-term problem that will inevitably be combated with interna international coalitions designed to combat it. Second of all, absent AI, violence will actually replace surveillance, making the problem worse. In the case of the Uyghurs, it is clear that the Chinese government, which has been engaging in oppression against its minorities for decades, would have pursued similar actions even without the existence of AI. Importantly, without surveillance as an option to suppress these ethnic groups, genocides would have solely consisted of violence. Suppressing populations is not unique to a world with or without AI, but AI gives countries an option to do so without mass murder. The Holocaust, Cambodian genocide, Armenian genocide, Rwandan genocide are all examples of how historical genocides have primarily consisted of mass murders. Remember, the resolution is about net harms and benefits, and although what China is doing right now is terrible, the alternative is far worse. Finally, my opponents discuss human rights. However, companies in free states can actually use AI to identify and assist members of oppressed states, which actually improves human rights. Through working with NGOs, AI will be leveraged to optimize delivery of aid, supplies, and services to refugees and displaced people. And Microsoft is even working on a multilingual chatbot to understand the language of refugees and identify areas of needed support. Through working with humanitarian organizations, AI will be leveraged for predicting human rights violations and spreading knowledge of potential solutions to those affected. Now let's move on to some of my opponent's attacks. First on health. My opponents claim that drugs only benefit 0.00025% of the world's population. I did the math and that's still 1.75 million people. Clearly it's net benefit. Then my opponents talk about consumerism, but their response is a slippery slope. Just because people purchase more goods does not mean that the environment will be destroyed. They never contextualize in this speech, so it should not be evaluated. For these reasons, please vote for the affirmative team. Thank you. Thank you. We'll again have another three minute prep period followed by the uh, second speech of the negative team.
It's the end of the preparation time period. We'll now have the second speech from the negative team for a period of five minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Am I audible? I'm sorry? Am I audible? Yes. The second affirmative speaker seems to confuse causation and correlation. It is not climate change that causes dictators. It is the unwillingness of dictators to fight climate change that makes the problem worse. It is not the healthcare crisis that displaces people from jobs. It is the unemployment that doesn't allow people to buy the drugs they need. Four areas of clash in this debate. First, authoritarianism. Second, the economy. Third, healthcare. Lastly, climate change. Let me begin with authoritarianism. First of all, they claim that this, this the oppression would happen otherwise. However, we have shown empirical evidence as to why it's 12 times more effective in a world of AI, precisely due to the AI monitoring they need to conceive. And precisely when it comes to genocide, absent AI, people can at least hide, but the only process of AI monitoring, it makes this impossible. Secondly, they talked about regulations. Know that Human Rights Watch warns that AI spyware specifically remains unregulated at the global level and there are insufficient national controls or limits on their export. The reason why this will not change in the long run is that those authoritarian countries are not incentivized to stop the tools of oppression. They want to deploy them because they want to strengthen their reign. Therefore, the long-term impacts are stronger and the these governance will be irreversible due to the silencing of the dissent. Therefore, they will proliferate authoritarianism in the long run. But third of all, they talk about AI language identification, but we believe this will actually harm, harm the refugees because AI will allow them to identify illegal refugees, deport them, and make them separated from them for, for, uh, from their families. This is notice panel that the scope of this impact is immense. 2.6 billion people live in authoritarian states and they will not have any opportunities to access human flourishing. Although the outcry of the voiceless is difficult to hear, we urge you to recognize that it is the rights and freedoms we are able to enjoy that shape our lives. Why is this impact more important than the affirmative constructed? Concerning healthcare, authoritarians don't care about the health of their citizens. AI proliferates. Secondly, on the economy. What did they tell us? They, they tell that productivity will create new jobs, but they haven't provided no, any mechanism nor a single instance as to how jobs will be created. We have explained how AI makes human intelligence redundant. Notice that according to the World Bank, 65% of the work before our farmers and Oxford research concludes that AI will block the traditional growth path by replacing low wage jobs with robots and therefore they will be they will fall into poverty and AI ultimately harms the most vulnerable. Notice that education will not help them because there will not be enough jobs to, pre, to, to employ those people in the first place. Therefore no requalification will uh, help and suffering will exacerbate in the long run and only harm the most vulnerable. But with second of all, when it comes to developing countries, we have explained how offshoring will reduce employment opportunities and economic activity in the developing world. Why is this impact more important than the affirmatives constructed? Healthcare systems around the world are broken due to the lack of resources and poor distribution of them. The World Bank found that the poorest and most vulnerable people are routinely forced to choose between healthcare and other necessities for their household, including food. WHO states that half the world population cannot access essential health services. Governments in developing countries won't deliver AI healthcare as they focus on more Pressing problems like lack of food or water. Healthcare costs exponentially more compared to delivering food. Unless there will be an economy that prospers, which AI harms, healthcare will remain inaccessible. And AI proliferates because the reshoring will worsen the economic situation there, taking developing countries to step backward on the road of development. This will reduce resources that could otherwise be used for better healthcare infrastructure and medical education, ultimately worsening their living standards of the most vulnerable. Thirdly, on healthcare. First of all, when it comes to pandemics, AI proliferates them by diminishing present public institutions. As Beth notes, AI algorithms encage people in social media bubbles, polarize society, and make authorities appear illegitimate in the eyes of the masses, which decreases obedience. Startup finds that 80% of Slovaks break COVID restrictions. Absent AI, the problem would never escalate to such an extent. Ultimately, prevention would save millions of lives, which is comparatively better than spending years waiting for a remedy. But second of all, in terms of accessibility, according to the UN, we have a cure against malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis. Yet 1.6 million Africans die annually of them because they are too expensive. Clearly, the incentives are not pointing in the right direction, and we have no reason to believe that AI will magically change that. Therefore, the most vulnerable will continue suffering. 
Fourthly, on climate change. When it comes to renewables, AI is doing the exact opposite. Because according to ExxonMobil, biotech sells AI to oil companies and expedite all discovery, extraction, distribution, growing the fossil fuel industry by 200 billion annually, thus disincentivizing key actors to become more uh, environmentally friendly. But on consumerism, note that this is massively important. According to Vogue Business, the fashion industry produces more emissions than France, Germany, and the UK. And which totals 2.1 billion tons of CO2 emissions. And the average, and notice that the causal link between climate change is there because those emissions are ultimately adding fuel to the fire of our planet. Therefore, climate change is actually worse on their side of the house. Conclusively, honorable judges, AI is a false promise that exacerbates the demons of our society. Vote negative. Thank you very much. That concludes our opening and second speeches and moves us to a cross-examination period, which will last approximately 10 minutes. And we will um, move back and forth between the two teams. I will ask again that captains be sure that everybody asks one question and everybody answers one question. Uh, so we will move to that immediately. And why don't we start with the, uh, uh, with the affirmative asking question of the negative. Absolutely. So we're going to start with a big picker, big picture question. You're claiming that one of the world's most impactful innovations is harmful. So in your ideal world, where do you draw the line on AI? Do you want some of it to still exist? Or do you want all of it to be removed? Like we never claim that there couldn't be any benefits of AI whatsoever. However, we would much rather live in a world where those marginal benefits don't exist at all, if it means that the harms would exist as well. Like we cannot truly draw a line and choose like we want those benefits, but we want to neglect those harms. The true role of your side in this debate is to accept the harms and explain why the benefits are more important. And conversely, we need to explain why the impacts of ours are more impactful, both in terms of scope and intensity, which we have proven. Therefore, while we agree that in certain instances, AI might yield some minor benefits, we are willing to concede it because we have proven why in the long run and in the short run as well, AI makes society worse off. Negative a question for the affirmative. So um, in your speech, you have mentioned that there are multiple regulations through AI surveillance and so on. However, my question is, how are you really planning to regulate authoritarian regimes such as China with surveillance, while China are one of the countries that never signed to any binding regulations or agreements? And what is your even plan uh, of, like, of regulating the most authoritarian states that never obey international regulations? Sure. So I'll start by answering this. And if my teammates want to add on, they're welcome too. So one of the ways that this regulation is extending to China is through effective corporate sanctions. For example, if we look at the recent news from the EU that they're planning on administering sanctions, that they're administering regulations on companies that use AI harmfully, some of those companies are Chinese companies that operate within the EU. That's where they collect data. That's where they refine their models so that they can come back to China, give those models to the Chinese government and eventually lead to oppression. By causing those regulations on Chinese companies, we are effectively, we are effectively, effectively sanctioning China as well. Question from the uh, affirmative facts to the negative. Um, this one. Well, do you want to go, Alex? Yeah, yeah, I'll take this one. So, in your speech, you mentioned that AI will displace a lot of low-skill workers. But if AI is going to create more high-skill, high-paying jobs. Why would low skill workers who get trained for those jobs be worse off at the end? And why are you insisting, is, insisting that we keep those people in low skill and low paying jobs? Firstly, we do not accept the notion that suddenly major jobs will appear because studies by Oxford University, University show us that as much as 47% of jobs can be automated. That is the reality. Simultaneously, we refuse the notion that AI creates jobs because AI exists, it existed for quite a while. Yet AI has only disrupted industries in the meantime. Think of Amazon, for example, or Google's automation of call centers. Like these displace low skill workers, but offer no alternative. You provided us jobs like operators of AI. There will be some education, yet reskilling programs across the globe fail. They have only as much as 10% success rate in getting people jobs. We don't believe that suddenly truckers, for example, who will be replaced by autonomous driving, will be able to transition into a high school programming job. That is not the reality. 
Okay. Question the other way. So how will international coalitions like the United Nations make sure that China will not abuse AI as it literally captured millions of Uyghurs in cap camps with reports of rape, castration, and torture, while the United Nations is not doing anything significant to stop? Because clearly, AI, China is, will not be regulated and no one else can regulate it. And it is in Chinese incentive to continue the abuse. So how do you want to prevent that? From yeah, so uh, I think one issue that you do not touch on is that in either world, China will continue its oppression of the Uyghurs pre-AI the level of oppression of the Uyghurs was very high. However, our argument is that AI provides the only tangible solution to helping these people. For example, we mentioned that through working with NGOs, AI can be leveraged to optimize delivery of aid, supplies, and services to those who are oppressed, those who are refugees, and those who are displaced. Yeah, also historically coalitions and different uh, multilateral organizations like the UN, the entire point of them is that they foster things like multilateral cooperation and force some countries to do things that they otherwise wouldn't want to do. So for example, like working with the World Trade Organization or other multilateral organizations, you see countries putting in different kinds of regulations or new pieces of legislation that previously wouldn't have existed if they weren't pressured by the international community. Just now we are seeing things like new sanctions being put on the people who are, uh, for example, advocating for the oppression of in China, like the executives that allow it to happen. And we're telling you that's a step towards action. And we're telling you that in the meantime, the only way to uh, help these Uyghurs uh, is presented by AI and the ability to target these refugees and help them escape. Question from the affirmative back to the negative. Yeah. Um, so I cannot take this question really quickly. So I think you all make the argument that digital authoritarianism is going to push right now countries that are on the brink between democracy and authoritarianism towards authoritarianism. But why would a country that is currently on the brink or a country that is previously democratic to like buy a technology meant for authoritarian oppression if it isn't already authoritarian? Negative. So we never claim that liberal democracies will suddenly to turn into autocracies, but we're talking specifically about hybrid political regimes where dissent is being repressed, but not effectively enough if there is no AI. And those are countries on the path of authoritarianism. And we are claiming the, the, that the exclusive change that will happen because of AI is that those regimes will slide into dictatorship. And we have provided an analysis as to why this can happen uniquely only with AI, precisely due to the omnipresence of monitoring devices, which silence any uh, hope of dissidents. Because absent AI, even though dissidents would still be hunted and prosecuted, it is not certain. Therefore, they are more likely to take risks. But once they know that for sure the police will go after them and they will be prosecuted no matter what, this effectively silences dissent and makes resistance nearly impossible. And this is the reason why those countries who are susceptible to authoritarian tendencies will eventually likely slide there. Question from the negative back to the affirmative. So you went along the lines of displacement will be only short term. We have seen in the industrial revolution that suddenly people were given jobs. Even the poor who were replaced were after some period given jobs. This is only a short term phenomenon. However, research by University of Cambridge and Oxford shows that, well, does it, that is not the case. Because even during the Industrial Revolution, it took as long as seven decades for the poorest to benefit from Industrial Revolution. Until then, they suffered hard in, and they endured immense hardship simply because there were no jobs for them. How do you compensate for this, even though AI is much different? Like, this is 70 years. Yeah. So uh, we would say two main things to that. And the first is that even if it takes a while for these benefits to get there, I'm sure all of us can agree that these uh, industrial revolutions have on net increased the quality of life for the majority of people. But the second thing we would say is that AI improves upon previous industrial revolutions. So for example, it took a lot of time for things like, for example, factories and the creation of a lot of machines and robots 
to be exported to these currently like developing countries, right? And that's why it took so long for these benefits to materialize. We tell you that AI, because it's based off of programming and doesn't require this hard capital investment in the first place, it allows for the far faster diffusion of ideas and technology that leads to far faster diffused benefits. And that's why we tell you that already we are seeing in developing countries, the creation of high tech sectors like Bitcoin in West Africa, or for example, the high, like these like uh, creation of like really high tech IT innovations from India. And all these innovations show that new industrial revolutions are going to be far better than previous ones. But uh, I guess I can ask a quick question if that's fine, Mr. Baker. Sure. Okay. Um, so I guess you all say that consumerism is going to increase. People are going to buy more and people are going to waste more. But you simul simultaneously say the lower and middle class all are going to lose their jobs and not have any money to buy these goods. So how does consumerism increase in a world where, according to you, they cannot afford to be consumers? So uh, this is a great question, actually, because this is a uh, big logical fallacy here, uh, because you assume that uh, when people get poorer, they're unable to buy things. However, as we see in our world right now, middle and lower class are still buying a lot of goods. Actually, it is mostly middle and lower class that are buying huge amounts of products and they are contributing to um, CO2 emissions very largely. Therefore, claiming that just by people losing their jobs, uh, they are going to stop consuming products is simply not true. They might lose their jobs and go into despair and spend a lot of money. These two things are not mutually exclusive in any way. It's time. Okay. Thanks to both teams. Nicely done. Nicely distributed as well. So now we will begin the um, judge cross-examination period where our panel will ask questions of the teams. We'll ask to Kind of keep those flowing back and forth one way or the other so we don't have to direct one direct questions one way or the other so uh about 30 minutes so at your leisure panel you may uh you may begin to question the teams please identify the team you're asking uh at the beginning of the question thank you so uh by tradition since uh i'm older than the two other judges combined <laughs> I get to ask the first question. Um, so I'm going to put it out this way, and I'm going to ask both teams to just respond to the way I framed my listening to this debate, which is what a judge does. We're not supposed to impose our own view, but we're to listen to what you say. And the way I frame it is this. There's common ground between the two sides that AI is a tremendously powerful instrument that will become only more powerful. So there's no dispute over that. The gravamen of the debate therefore becomes uh, twofold in my view. Uh, the first is of course, all the topics you discussed, distribution of benefits. Does this, uh, have something approaching an equitable distribution of the benefits that are produced, or does it simply exacerbate the concentration of benefit society among the privileged who can either purchase or access more easily? And then the second is uh, the danger of, of evil, be it uh, the evil of displacement or uh, the uh, the evil doers getting this powerful instrument to magnify their evil doing. So that's the frame, and I'm kind of doing the balance you want me to do uh, by balancing within that framework. I'd like each side to tell me where you think I've got it wrong, and uh, if you don't think I have it wrong. Give me your one strongest argument within that frame. Affirmative, negative, who wants it? Um, I guess I can start really quickly. Um, and then my teammates can add on if they want. Um, we think that obviously AI, uh, 
sorry, I know you asked for one, but I think we have two main benefits that come from AI. Um, the first one is innovation, because now we are able to process far larger bodies of data, which allows for things like medical innovation and climate change. And our opponents obviously say these. And then uh, the second thing is like the workforce thing. And again, this goes back to your idea of where are the benefits being distributed and how are they being distributed? So to us, the most important thing isn't necessarily checking uh, and watching and monitoring the absolute inequality, but rather making sure that everyone is benefited. So for example, uh, let's say, the, let's take the vaccine as, as an example, the COVID-19 vaccine. It's very unequal, unequally distributed right now, right? You see a lot more vaccines going to developed countries than developing ones. However, again, we say that if on net, these, these vaccines are being distributed in a way that save millions of lives, it's not a reason, inequality is not a reason to essentially reject vaccines altogether. But the second thing that we also say is that AI is unique because the lack of hard capital needed to invest in it, you don't need big buildings to create an AI program. We tell you specifically that low barriers to entry allow for a far more equal competition. So right now, multinational corporation, corporations can buy huge factories and then economies of scale happens. But um, AI essentially allows for this to change and allows for a more equal distribution of wealth throughout society. Absolutely. I want to add on with the remaining time that we have that one of the best benefits of AI is that it allows developing countries to be able to correct the shortages that they have in labor without relying upon developed countries for that. Consider, for example, teacher and doctor shortages in Southeast Asia, which have been resolved because currently existing teachers can use AI to supplement what they have. This diminishes the dependence that developing countries have on developed countries, which shows, once again, why this is a, a, a really good way of distributing the wealth of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Negative, would you like to take a shot at uh, the question? Yes, definitely. Um, so answering to two of your um, layers of the question, first of all, distribution of benefits. Uh, you know, to respond partially to what was said by the affirmative speaker that uh, a lot of countries would be, like we would go away from being reliant on developing world, we actually believe this is exactly the immense harm of distribution of benefits that you asked us about. So for example, uh, the entire narrative provided by the affirmative to us was actually that AI will create huge revenue streams and huge outputs to the economy. However, this is very important to understand that huge outputs to the economy does not do not necessarily mean that it's going to be distributing things equally and very clear mechanisms for this should be provided on all layers. And, um, Secondly, the, to your to your question about dangers of evil, uh, we believe we like neither as the affirmative. We do not stand for absolute equality either, because this is simply not possible. However, we believe that we cannot put up with affirmative sites assumption about AI's benefits because these assumptions are very dangerous, since. Um, we might assume that vaccines are going to develop. However, there are very many ways how it will actually, like the uh, wealth accumulated on the very top will prevent the vaccines from getting to developing world. But if I may shortly add to this, like while even in our worst where the equality, inequality wouldn't get that worse, like what is the unique harm of the affirmative is not just that they are benefiting solely the most fortunate, but they are actively harming the most vulnerable members of our society. And this is a unique harm they are causing, and we strongly oppose that. Next question. I can take the next question. Um, right. So one of the kind of sub topics that's come up in this debate, or one of the, the contentions between the teams seems to be between long-term and short-term impacts. Uh, so the affirmative pointed out that uh, the industrial revolution is probably seen by most people today as a net benefit, while the negative pointed out that it took 70 years for those benefits to, uh, to reach the poorest in society. Um, and that makes me wonder, you know, what makes the AI revolution, if such a revolution is happening, different from previous instances of technological advancement. Um, do you have a clear argument? And so this would go to the, the negative first, uh, but I would also like to hear the affirmative thought on this. Do you, do you have a clear argument uh, as to whether the advancement of AI technology is fundamentally different from previous advances in technology and will not eventually result 
in a net improvement to the quality of life in the same way that the industrial revolution has, unless you disagree with that as well. Negative? Yes, so uh, first of all, uh, you have pointed out really well that uh, it took a while for the industrial revolution to actually reach the very bottom of the social ladder. However, here we believe the things are very, very different because uh, while during industrial revolution, uh, people were actually created with more jobs because it created entire new industries, AI does not necessarily create new industries as well as because it is able to improve itself, it does not create new jobs with AI since it already, you know, you might assume that it, the jobs of, you know, working with AI will be created. However, AI can work with itself already. So this is very important here because, um, because basically um, the distribution of, of these benefits will be very low. Uh, and yes. Affirmative. Go ahead, Jonathan. Okay, yeah, sure. I'll talk about this, I guess, really quickly. So I think the, the idea here is that we both have statistics that say opposite things, right? We present statistics that say jobs will increase and they say jobs will decrease. They say that AI is unique because it can improve by itself. Although this is true to some extent, I will. I think everyone knows that there is no real like general intelligence uh, AI that exists yet or is predicted to exist in the coming years, right? We don't see an AI that can actively look at itself, improve itself in a way that's really substantive, which is why we still have people and programmers working with AI. So for example, we have machine learning experts. They look at different parameters that they program the AI with and different code that they use, right? And afterwards, when they see issues, they have to recode things. So for example, if they see biases in the code, right, they have to recode it uh, to decrease these biases. When they see a large amounts of error, they have to think about maybe there's a more efficient way to do this, right? There are always going to be new jobs that are created as a result of this entirely new industry. And this new innovation is only going to spur more and more jobs. And we've seen this in every single industrial revolution, right? And um, something that we want to like point out is that media again and again has always said the same thing, right? So Lewis Anslow actually did a um, analysis of media in the past hundred years. And every single time we see a technological revolution, you see mass hysteria. You, you see that people are scared that all their jobs are going away, but historically it's never happened. And we don't think it's ever going to happen because humans at the end are adaptable and they find new ways to fit in in the global economy. We've seen it time and time again. And just to add on very briefly, I think that one thing that differentiates this revolution compared to previous ones is because of how increasingly interconnected everything is through the invention of the internet. So AI is primarily done through computers. And right now, each and every one of us in this room can actually program AI. We can learn AI through online platforms, and we can also use um, various codes. For example, there's PyTorch, that's one, there's TensorFlow. All of those are accessible to us as individuals. That's why we see countries, even developing countries, sparking AI innovations in their, in their places. For example, India, China, all of those countries are also developing um, new AI technologies because of how increasingly digitalized the world has become. And as a result of it, it's far more accessible and other countries around the world can actually access the benefits of it compared to before. Is there time for me to add something on or is that it? Real quick. All right, so one, to specifically answer your question of how have things changed since the Industrial Revolution of the past, well, in the 1930s, when Frederick Owen, FDR, passed the New Deal, he opened what has been a near century of welfare. This welfare is allowing for those who are unemployed, who lose their jobs, to still be protected by the government. And that is the reason why inequality will not explode through AI. In addition, okay. AI creates its own jobs dynamically because of the needs that it has for the workforce. Thank you. Thank you. Christina, do you have a question? Thank you. Uh, I actually have a question for the affirmative. The negative has clearly said that AI, this is about authoritarianism um, and the spread of genocide, but that AI has face recognition technology algorithms have clearly exacerbated the ability of dictators to hunt down and, and chill speech um, against them and political dissidents. How you have argued that China will regulate itself um, in this process, so that dictators will regulate themselves. How and why do you think that that is true? So, uh, I think that 
our argument isn't that these dictators are going to regulate themselves. Our argument is that there's going to be external pressure that forces them to increase regulation. For example, one example that my partner brought up um, was the EU's new regulations on the use of this harmful AI. And specifically, Chinese companies are the ones that are providing this technology to the government. And if the uh, EU, which a lot of Chinese companies rely on for data centers, tells them that a precondition to receiving our data, receiving our resources, is to end the business deals with China in terms of facial recognition technology, and that will in turn pressure them to you know, stop giving China these, this technology and prevent it from causing a real problem. Yeah, and uh, quickly to add on, um, although they do argue that there might be an exacerbation of these things that are already occurring, the key thing to notice is that these are pre-existing problems, right? The oppression of Uyghurs is a very long-lasting issue that has been an issue in China for a long time. But uniquely, AI is the only way that we have been able to, in some ways, solve this problem, right? We've used it for humanitarian aid and helping refugees escape. And this is one of the uh, ways and the avenues in which we can address this crisis that occurs with or without AI. It's because, like, for example, even if it's a little easier now, we still saw the assassination of like political dissidents and many, many regimes before we saw these things happening for very long periods of time. So AI isn't uniquely causing all these harms, but it is causing a unique benefit. Right. Uh, Negative, would you like to respond to that? So I would like to know that while it is true that China has been incentivized to oppress Uyghurs even before AI. We have provided evidence showcasing that the number of annual prosecution in Xinjiang has increased 12 times from less than 30,000 a year to over 350,000 a year. Clearly, the exclusive harm AI is, is the magnification of the malevolent incentives. And the reason our, uh, our, our opponents fail to recognize that this will not go away because authoritarianism as such is impacting all those countries in the long term, precisely because of the mechanism of the inability to uh, the inability to voice criticism towards the government and omnipresent surveillance, those dissidents will not be able to protest, and because of that, silent uh, dissent will die, and those authoritarian regimes will become irreversible, therefore harmful in the long term. If I may follow up on that as well. Um, the authoritarian regimes being irreversible is the key difference that makes it different from uh, a con consistent example of industrial revolution brought by the affirmative. Because uh, while there it hasn't been the dictators and authoritarian leaders taking the power and consolidating that in their hands, while here it is simply the case and it is not so simply reversible as it was in the cases of other revolutions. Okay, anyone on the panel, another question? I'd like to ask a question towards the negative team and clarification of one of their arguments actually as well. Sure. The affirmative says, you know, has a pretty interesting analogy that's just the existence of the vaccine, even if it's not distributed properly, still means that doesn't mean the vaccine itself is bad. Um, and you've said inequality is the primary problem. Uh, can you speak to that? How does that prove that AI should not be used at all, even if there are some distribution issues? Well, we see AI creating problems across the scope of its usage. We see AI, even though it distributes, for example, vaccines in this analogy, it benefits some people. The thing is it creates problem across the way. The thing is that AI is utilized to spread polarization. It is used to disrupt trust in governance. It is used to disrupt belief in democracies. It is used to disrupt trust in science. This is problematic because even though if we can accrue some benefits, to which we concede like AI may, might bring some innovations, the thing is that the benefit is non-existent once nobody believes in them. Once people are unable, unable to access them, for example, because they don't believe in science and they are not willing to take vaccines. The problem is further accrued and further aggravated once the, once the people are basically defying the laws. Once people are not willing to obey the authorities and further aggravate the problem. If I could follow up on that as well, we have seen that in the case of uh, Russian trolls in 2018 and other years where they have had entire buildings of uh, bots writing disinformation about vaccines. Therefore, 
entirely uh, aggravating the situation of vaccines in the world, like the situation of misinformation about vaccines in the world. And regardless of how much the affirmative develops vaccines, even though that change is very insignificant, the the amount of power the authoritarian nations get with uh, like AI to spread this misinformation about vaccines like Russia did is going to be huge. And if I may further add on it, this problem extends beyond vaccinations only because because of this AI polarization, the trust in government has diminished. And what that means is that even something as simple as face mask has become a political symbol, which disincentivizes many people to obey by the rules. And this alone has worsened the spread of the corona pandemic. And we believe that preventing the cause itself would save much more lives than waiting for the vaccine to come, to come along. Additional questions from the panel. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to. I'm going to ask my question before Julian because he's a lot smarter than me. So I want to get in this. I'm going to build on Christina. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by what I think is a difference between your conversation over the COVID vaccine and the rest of the conversation about AI. So the COVID vaccine itself is not claimed to have any uh, negative side to it. Okay, we know there are some negative effects, but we want people vaccinated. And if it's distributed inequitably, at least whatever is given to the poorest of the poor helps them. It doesn't hurt them. Uh, now, the negative comes in in a different angle on that. I'm not going to get into that. They come in and say that AI exacerbates fictions about the COVID vaccine. I'm putting that to the side for the moment. Where I want to go is a different branch from the one that was just examined, which is, you know, there's a, if you look at the progress of weaponry over the years, right, the introduction of nuclear weapons, concentrated power in the hands of a few almost the same way with steel weapons two millennia before. Uh, so, so here we have a powerful instrument. Again, I'm going back to my basic analysis. All, all six of you agree, this is a powerful instrument. Who's likely to reap the benefits in each of the areas? Is that likely to exacerbate inequality and oppression? And for me then, it comes the, the 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 answer that's been given so far about the COVID vaccine doesn't get to that underlying question of the concentration of not just benefit but power. So so I'd like the affirmative and negative to just elaborate because that's where the debate's coming down for me. Is is the is 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 this powerful instrument going to be uh, operating differently? for the benefit of those in power. And I'm not just talking about autocrats, I'm talking about the plutocrats. It's a great question. Fire away, oh, guys. Oh, sorry. Oh, wait, sh should I answer, Mr. Hi, John. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll just go quickly. I think we've said this a couple of times, but the reason we think artificial intelligence is so good in terms of uh, equally distributing wealth throughout the uh, world is because AI is so accessible. We explained many times that the developing countries, although they don't have a lot of hard infrastructure, things like huge buildings and the ability to make these huge factories that we talk about, like things like industrialization, we explained that AI is still booming in these areas. For example, we tell you that 3 million AI related jobs were created in Africa because of different algorithmic programming, um, you know, like innovations in these areas. And we also say the same things happening in, for example, India and other Southeast Asian countries. And what we're trying to say is that AI is unique because in the status quo, the majority of wealth is distributed based off of who has the most hard capital to invest into these economies of scale. AI is uniquely turning this on its head by allowing everyone to have access to this new source of wealth that is booming, right? And again, we're seeing it being distributed in some of the poorest nations. And this, again, goes to show that right now, obviously, we are seeing that hard capital, the people who control the hard capital rule the world. AI changes this, and we're telling you that's on it a benefit for inequality. Okay. Negative? 
So uh, this is quite simple here. We have to understand that AI might help vaccination. Uh, however, the benefits that they're bringing are incredibly inaccessible to most of the people. Uh, let's talk about, for example, developing countries. We can see right now that most of the countries around the globe do not have access to vaccines that uh, powerful countries have. And what is important here, as we have pointed out through our, our speeches, uh, is that AI is actually you know, even exaggerating that. It exaggerates the, the amount of power held in the hands of the few and in the hands of the most developed nations in this entire world. And what is very important here is that these nations are not very prone to share. We know that European Union has a lot of vaccines, yet Ukraine does not. And this is very visible in, in the vaccine situation precisely, because it, ex it is exactly the concentration of power or medicine or medical advancement in the hands of developed countries who have all the control over AI that is going to prevent the distribution of vaccines and access to the vaccines. And if I may follow up on that, we would yeah. also like to note that poor people are more likely to believe co they are more susceptible to misinformation about vaccination campaigns, for instance, and therefore oftentimes end up being even more harmed. Another question from the panel. Yes. So uh, luckily, John asked my question. Um, so I'm going to follow up on that because I agree this is a, this is really an important issue. Uh, I, I see it as possibly the crucial question in this debate, which is who holds the power? Um, and what I'm hearing uh, on the affirmative side is that if you look at the developing world, you can see job growth. Um, and because AI is mostly in the form of software, it's highly accessible. Um, whereas on the negative, I'm hearing that developed countries hold the vast majority of advances in AI and AI technology, which also seems true to me. Um, and it seems like it might be hard to have this conversation without talking about colonialism. If we were to ask, what do the jobs numbers look like when much of the world was colonized by Western powers? We might see increase in jobs, but we might disagree about the implications that that has for costs and benefits. And when jobs are created in developing countries, but the technology exists in developed countries, the question that comes to mind, because it does seem clear to me that with a software-based technology, you can have startups, you can have local economies take advantage of the existing technology. But the question that I'm left with is what decides who wins? Is it going to be, is the next Google going to come out of Nigeria? Or is Google going to expand and rule the world. Okay. Now that, that was a specific version of the question, but I think you, you get at my general question. What decides who has the power? And Let's can you convince with, me? Okay, that's great. Let's start with the affirmative. Okay. Um, I think I, the important thing before I answer this question is to set the stage for what it means, right? We have to look at a comparative in a world with and without AI. So without AI, we obviously know that because of things like colonialism and imperialism and the way in which previous industrial revolutions distributed wealth, it's already extremely unequal. That's key because we tell you that any marginal increase in the amount of capital flowing into these developing countries is a net positive. And again, what we've proven is that we're not looking in a world where like we're, we're not trying to evaluate whether AI as a whole uh, causes inequality, but rather whether or not AI's domination is comparatively better in comparison, again, with previous industrial revolutions, things like reliance on large factories and things that require lots of hard capital. And again and again, obviously, right, the reason why we're having this like conversation about developed and developing is because that's exactly how power is distributed now, right? The rich countries are the global dominators, right? And the poorer countries are not. But the fact that we are seeing these huge hubs of technological innovation in places like West Africa, like for example, Nigeria is one of the biggest Bitcoin miners in the entire world, right? We're explaining that accessible technology is the way to change this all and make it so that it's not about, I guess like it makes it so that the next Google can come from anywhere because anyone has the ability to create the next Google, to create the next big thing. And that's what we tell you um, is the spirit of AI. Okay. Negative. 
if I may respond, sure. All sure. we need to do is to show you the reality. All we need to do is refute their analysis, is to give you a reality check. Only 2% of Africans, people on the African continent, have access to mobile phones. They are talking about people not having the need to utilize capital. No big buildings, just software. Ladies and gentlemen, no such thing exists across this continent. This, although they say it is accessible across the world, it's only utilized across the developing, the developed world. Like PwC and McKinsey studies show that Africa and Southeast Asia are the continents least likely to benefit from this artificial intelligence. Like why would they create jobs in industry in, con in continents who are predominantly focused on agrarian economies? Something just doesn't match here. The thing is that what we see is precisely the colonialism and oppression because we use as the developed world those countries only when we need them. That is why we are reshoring jobs back home when we have automation. That is the reason why Adidas is moving factories back home to Germany, leaving these countries with no infrastructure. And that is the impact of AI. It is like the aggravation of the trend we also hate. It is making the condition worse for the poor guy in the developing world and better for the guy owning the capital. In this case, the software. Thank you very much. We have about a minute left. I'm not sure we have the opportunity to jump in. Does anyone on the panel have a quick question for either team? Okay. A quick question, sorry, quick question. Is that the central question for both teams about equality or inequality? And if you could just like phrase what that central question is to your each of your teams, I think that would be helpful for all of us. So I'll begin with the affirmative. I think that Inequality is not the central question of today's debate. Our argument is that inequality is pre-existing. We've seen that before AI, there have been massive power imbalances. But our argument is that AI can help developing nations, help marginalized communities equalize the playing field. Because unlike previous industrial revolutions, AI is increasingly accessible. People in Africa have access to it. And contrary to what my opponents say, it's not just 2% of people who have mobile phones. 650 million people in Africa have access to a mobile phone. And if you don't believe me, just do a Google search. And there's a total of 1.2 billion people in Africa. So if you do the math, that's about 50%. So clearly, because of increasing digitalization, access to the internet, access to this AI technology is more prevalent than ever in developing countries have a unique opportunity to capitalize that and equalize the playing field. Okay, we're gonna let the negative respond to that very quickly, about 30 seconds. We'll add a little time and then we'll move to uh, to closing statements. Negative. So, so our main idea is that the deaths of poor people in developing countries and the misery imposed by AI is leading to global inequality and injustice. But on top of the worsened inequality, we also believe that the central question is not inequality per se, but rather the the suffering of the most vulnerable members of society, which we have explained in two different spheres. Firstly, with economy, but also authoritarianism, those innocent billions of people who will be oppressed by authoritarian governance. And it is crucial in this debate. I would also like to add, while the AI will not really help those that are well off right now, it will only harm those that are worse off in the current step in the program. Thank, thank you very much. We're now ready for closing statements. We'll start with the negatives closing statement for a, a period of five minutes, and you may start when ready. I show you guys as, as uh, muted. Yes, uh, we're starting. <laughs> Before I start, am I audible? Yes. Nice. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no such thing, no such thing as a free lunch. Team Affirmative has made this painfully obvious. In my speech, I will show you what is the difference between industrial revolution and AI, and what is the devil of the problem. Who will really benefit from this technology and who will suffer the most? Firstly, let's look at our constructive line, and that is economics, where the affirmative told us that suddenly those who are suddenly in mundane, repetitive, low-skill positions will be able to transition. They'll be able to adapt. 
without providing any sort of analysis or mechanism. Even though education is accessible because of AI platforms, it, so far we haven't seen any benefit whatsoever. They expect trackers to become engineers. They expect people to compete with a technology that can improve upon itself. This is a leading burden that the human and that humanity cannot overcome because the scale of automation and intensity will likely be immense. But furthermore, what happens is the trickle down economics. The fallacy they tell us once the rich will get richer, once those developed countries will benefit, the money will be spent across the economy. We have seen industrial revolution where we just something completely different from AI revolution. However, we believe that we can use their benefits. This is the narrative of the team affirmative because even though they claim AI is so revolutionary, this, they compare it to the benefits of industrial revolution. We believe that no, even though if the automation is short term, it took almost 70 years for people for the poorest ranks of the socioeconomic ladder to benefit. This is a problem because we have shown you that those people who will be most hurt by automation will be in Africa, they will be in Southeastern Asia, and this will only reinforce the trends of colonization and of oppression of these countries. This is a problem if this is directly caused by a technology, if jobs will be restored back home to the developed world and those people will be left to starve, that is a problem and we cannot allow that to happen on our watch. We cannot enable AI automation to automate two thirds of the working poor in developing world. This is the problem. We want to preserve the quality of life. We want to use technology that creates a world that is equitable, not one that benefits only the rich at the top. But second, moving to, moving to, moving to authoritarianism because it affects 3.9 billion people across the globe. And the affirmative wanted to portray our world as something that is only short term. Like notice that oh, it will be just 70 years, those people will suffer only for a period of time. But we have shown you gradually in this debate that authoritarian governance due to AI is something irreversible. It is not enough from team affirmatives to tell us like malevolent incentives exist, like China is what it is, because if technology of AI can be compared to gas chambers because it directly increases the scope and the intensity of genocides in China, it is not enough to tell us that suddenly it will be regulated if there is clearly no incentive to do so. It is not enough to tell us that, well, if 30 people were detained before AI and 350,000 after AI was deployed, suddenly the world will become a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not just a trend in China. We can draw this trend across, across the globe because China has been exporting this technology to as much as 60 countries globally. And this directly affects the quality of life of millions and billions globally. This is a problem that team affirmative has provided no solution whatsoever. They aim to mitigate it with some benefits. However, we have shown you that those will be accrued by the most luckiest one, the most at the top of the socioeconomic ladder. That is a problem because totalitarian, totalitarian regimes do not care about healthcare of their citizens. That is why their life expectation is much lower than in the developed world. Those are problems the affirmative has refused to solve. They gave us analyses of healthcare, where AI will give us the solution for malaria. Well, it happened. AI gave us the medicine and vaccine for malaria, yet still 1.6 million people die annually in Africa and Southeastern Asia, simply because the drugs do not come to those countries. It is the problem because the only benefit is recruited by the most, most rich at the expense of the vulnerable. Simultaneously on climate change, we have shown you, even though they might have some benefit, even though they can create better renewables, the problem is that consumerism will still, still become a problem. It is not enough to tell us like people would have spent either way when you create additional pollution and when you make the situation worse. The problem at the end of the day is that our negative harms are tangible in the status quo. So far, AI has only disrupted industries. It has not created the jobs they are talking about. It has only benefited the rich just like in the industrial revolution. Only we believe that the trend will be re reinforced. And that is what the empirics show us. AI can ad adapt at a faster pace than humans. AI can benefit the richer at a much higher rate. These are the facts, and this is the trend that will prevail. The poor will suffer at the expense of the rich. That's time. <laughs> Thank you. We'll now have the final uh, five minute rebuttal from the affirmative. Start when ready. I had a quick verbal indication, I mean, not verbal, a uh, quick indication that everyone's ready. Cool. Go ahead. And we will begin now. As Dr. Sexton asked earlier, who benefits from AI? 
We explain this very clearly, and again, we've supported it over and over. The unique benefit of AI is its accessibility. What's gone unresponded to is this notion that AI, unlike previous industrial revolutions, is not dependent on hard capital. Anyone can learn to code. Alex and Shariar, my partners, for example, they've already done internships in AI. They've worked with college professors and they've learned things about AI, specifically from online courses. The information is there and it's up to all of us to use it. The reason why this is so important is again, because we explain that right now the global order, world order is based off of who has money and whoever has money continues to get more while the poor get poorer and poorer. However, uniquely, AI reverses this, it puts it on its head, and it makes everyone competitive, which is why, again, we tell you that there are huge amounts of innovation coming from developing nations like those in West Africa or, for example, India, and we've seen huge innovations coming from there in the realm of AI. This increases the amount of equality, and according to our opponents, this is a really, really important part of the debate. But let's talk about some other specifics anyways. They say that it's very hard for people to adapt, but again, they, can, they don't respond to the warranting about what I just said, right? Anyone can learn things like computer programming and the information is all online. Because of this, there is, it is so easy to retrain. And we also show that in the long term, even if things are bad in the short term, these adjustments get made and the macroeconomic imbalances correct themselves. They tell you specifically that it took 70 years in the last industrial revolution for the developing countries to get the benefits. That's what we're relying on right now. By instead replacing this with AI, where we see developing countries catching up in one or two years at the most, we know that on net we're decreasing inequality and helping the distribution of wealth worldwide. Next. Let's talk about this idea of authoritarianism. Again, the most important part here is that this was an issue far before AI and our opponents don't make the comparative. For example, the assassination of political dissidents and the oppression of ethnic groups has been happening for a very, very long time. And again, we tell you that we are the only unique benefit. While they cannot provide a unique harm, we are the only way that right now we are seeing countries, free countries, do things like aid those that are being oppressed and decrease the amount of authoritarianism. For example, we tell you AI is powering collaborations with NGOs to do things like get refugees out of places like Xinjiang where they're being oppressed, the Uyghurs are being genocided, right? We are providing new solutions while their problems have been existing for a long time. Then they talk about how right now medicine and things like consumerism are a big problems brought upon by AI. Let's start with medicine. Again, if anything, this is a, a this is a case study in how right now there is an unequal distribution of wealth and only certain people gain access to important goods. Through AI increasing the production of things like medicine and the innovation of new medicines, you only see cheaper and cheaper goods and more and more people getting access to these goods. This ties in to a concession they make implicitly when they talk about consumerism. Like we say in Crossfire, at the end of the day, they tell you there are huge amounts of unemployment, but they also tell you even when people are unemployed, they're able to buy things like basic necessities and they still consume a lot of things. This is key because it brings, again, to mind one of the most important benefits of AI, which is that even if AI decreases your wages, for example, your real wages increase because the prices of all these things you need decreases. Like we say, worker production increases drastically. We see a $13 trillion increase in global economic activity by 2030 alone. And through all this, we see more production and more access to things that are important. Last of all, let's talk about consumerism and climate change. Again, the weighing in terms of how climate change interacts with the rest of the round is not really interacted with by our opponents. We tell you that the exacerbation of climate change and climate disasters specifically leads to authoritarianism and leads to unequal distribution of wealth because developing countries are impacted the most. This is key because although our opponents talk about things like emissions, we tell you that consumerism is very, very minor. But most importantly, we know that the carbon dioxide that has been ex like has been exhaled by all these uh, essentially like these industrial uh, creations, things like factories, they already exist, which is why adaptation is inevitable and we need to focus on adaptation. We know that climate disasters are going to occur. So how are we combating this? 
The only solvency for things like climate disasters is again, AI. We are the only ones with a unique benefit here. And we tell you that through the use of AI, the unpredictability of climate change is decreased. We see increased output from things like farms, decreased food shortages, decreased crises, and uh -huh. on net, we're saving millions of people. Uh -huh. Therefore, we strongly urge an affirmative uh -huh. ballot. Thank you. Gary Blair, high school on the affirmative, team Slovakia on the negative, resolved that the benefits of artificial intelligence outweighs the harms. That concludes the championship round of the 2020-21 International Public Policy Forum season. Uh, congratulations to both teams uh, for uh, what was a fine debate, and thank you to the panel for uh, excellent questions, which uh, uh, helped focus the arguments very well. Uh, we'd ask you not to disconnect uh, from the from your from the the room, uh, but students, coaches, and others viewing the audience in the viewing audience are now invited to take a, a ten minutes probably uh, recess as our judges complete their ballots. And as a reminder to judges, uh, if you'd like additional time to complete your ballots, you can do that. Just uh, send a uh, uh, <clears throat> send the ballot to uh, Andrea or to me, and I'll forward it to her. Uh, I think everybody has my cell phone number. It'd probably be faster to do it that way. And, and uh, uh, so if you will send me your decision when, you, when you've made it, and uh, we will reconvene as soon as I have all three uh, ballots from the final round. Teams, congratulations. Wonderful job. Congratulations on a fantastic season and, uh, and a wonderful debate. So we are adjourned for a little while until, uh, until we get all the ballots in. Okay. We could uh, ask the, uh, I don't really know how to check to see if all the teams are back, if all the teams are here, all the, if Will's in the room, I see there's Will, I see Andrea. You're good, David. I am good, good, okay. Good, good, good. Well, well. Uh, I now received the decision from the judges, from all three judges, before we announce the winner. I'd like to extend our congratulations to both teams. Uh, it was a very challenging year and a difficult topic, one of the most accomplished fields we've ever had in the history of the IPPF. I want to commend all of you for your outstanding level of success during a, a pandemic as you adapted to a new learning environment, found a way to distinguish yourself in this rigorous competition. The final round of the 2020-21 uh, International Public Policy Forum contest uh, by a vote of two to one. I'm pleased to announce that the Slovak national team has been named the IPPF world champions for this year. Congratulations. Congratulations to Slovak national team. So in addition to receiving the Brewer Cup, your team will also be awarded $10,000, that's $5,000 for your team, and $5,000 in individual scholarships. Congratulations. And of course, we also want to recognize the amazing team from Montgomery Blair High School. As runner-up, your team will receive a second place trophy and also $3,500. Congratulations, both teams. You guys are amazing, did great today. Um, before we close, I might, if he doesn't mind, put Dr. Sexton on the spot for a second and see if he has any brief closing thoughts for our two finalists from this year's competition. You know, it's uh, when I was dean of NYU's law school, I would say to the admissions dean, now you have to understand for those outside the United States that uh, in the United States, you finish university and then you do three years of law school. So the typical student would be coming at least four years after finishing uh, secondary education where these young people are. And I would say to our Dean of Admissions uh, at the law school that uh, she put a great deal of effort into the evaluation of all kinds of standardized tests and academic records and so forth. But if she just allowed me to go to the uh, the National High School Debate Tournament in the United States with the IPPF and, and just uh, say right then and there to the young people on the quarterfinal teams, let alone the finals, that each was admitted to NYU Law School, that we would have uh, admitted uh, 
from the very, very best, the very, very best. There's another way to think about that, which I've lived in my life. I wouldn't be with you here today were it not for the fact that uh, uh, I myself debated and then I stayed in the world of debate. But the, the generation of friends and for you in IPPF, literally friends around the world. And I hope that the two teams will spend a little bit of time with that highly accessible internet that was discussed and, and demonstrated today and build a relationship between the two schools, but more importantly, with each other. Begin to network with each other. Because uh, I, I wouldn't have gone to law school, wouldn't have become an academic lawyer, wouldn't have applied, wouldn't have been admitted, were it not for the fact that uh, a group of the friends that I had made uh, when I was debating with and against them sat me down at uh, a summer debate camp on Georgetown University's campus as I turned 30 and said, it's time for you to go to law school. And that is what not only brought me here today, but because I met my extraordinary wife on the first day of class and married her two months later, that changed my life. And it was all a product of the friends that I had made through debate. Uh, I'm going to predict because the six people, every single one of you was a champion. And I'm not just saying that. I'm not trying to gild the lily. Your, your mental adaptation, the feature that I, I like two parts of this tournament that uh, Bill and David and the folks in Texas uh, created uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, I like the fact that it starts off with writing. And I like the fact that it forces you to think nimbly as the judges question you in the hot part of the round. And I've never seen a group, there certainly has been no group. I've, I've judged every single final round. And I'm sure David would agree with me on this. There's never been a group that's done better and I know that the coaches of some of the teams <laughs> were among those. And I'm saying this in front of them. There's never been a team that's done better top to bottom, all six performers than the six of you today. And I think that your parents should be proud of you and, and you should be proud of you. And I, I say to my law students now at NYU, and uh, I'll just close with this because in my class of 85 students last fall, I had nine PhDs. I had uh, one of the men that invented Dropbox. Uh, you know, I, I had some really smart people in that class. And I, I said to all of them, because I, I recognized even in them, 85 students at what arguably is the best, certainly one of the three or four best law schools in the world, among all that talent, so many of them had the imposter syndrome and thought that they didn't belong there. And I'm gonna say it to you right now, none of you will ever be an imposter in any place where intelligence and civil discussion counts. You're really expert at it already. You were given a great gift that you had nothing to do with earning. Your parents didn't even have the capacity to give it to you. And I say that as the grandfather of a 12 day old, we don't know whether little Ellis is going to be smart or not. You were all born smart. And you have a duty now to use that really well because you had nothing to do with getting that. So go and do well in the world and do good. Move the world the way you argue today uh, and never feel like an imposter. Never feel like an imposter. Just develop an internal clock of excellence that each of the six of you met today. External badges like the trophies and the checks don't mean a damn thing. You develop that internal clock of excellence that you did as well as you could, but you're imperfect beings. So the question becomes, how do you get better each day? So thank you, Andrea and David, for letting me be a part of this. Will, I'm proud of you and the NYU involvement in this. Uh, God bless you. you uh, you've been at this for almost as long as me. But to the stars of the show, uh, I genuflect before you. If I were in a room with you, I'd do it physically. And 
to Christina, good to see you again. And to Julian, I'm gonna to touch your hair and see that sizzling talent. Uh, all right, thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Sexton. Thank you, Christina. And thank you, Julie and our judges. Um, we also want to extend our appreciation to Will Baker and the NYU debate team who've been amazing, especially during finals weekend, the NYU ambassadors. And a big thank you to Pacey Yon, who is our student coordinator on the NYU debate team. She helped coordinate a lot of the, evalu the written evaluations this year. And we're really thankful to her. Um, so before we close on behalf of William Brewer and the Brewer Foundation and New York University, congratulations again to our new IPBF World Champions, Slovak National Team, and to our second place team, Montgomery Blair High School on a tremendous debate. We're so incredibly proud of you. Um, we hope to see all of you next year when the IPBF returns to New York and the Council on Foreign Relations, the Harold Pratt House. Um, with that, we will conclude the 20th annual IPBF. Congratulations, everyone. Goodbye, everybody. Great job, y'all. Thank you for a great debate. Thank you very much. Wonderful debate. Thanks well, to uh, Ethan, my, my